Uh, really delighted to have such a good turnout here. Thank you very much for joining us. And of course, I'm thrilled Caroline Devine's here as well and will talk to us a bit about her work and the amazing, extraordinary new piece that she's composed uh, that's currently on in the shopping centre. We had a quick chat yesterday and I actually stopped you from saying anything because I didn't want you to um, have to repeat uh, too much then. But I think the first time, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the first time that we met uh, was when you were awarded the Community Foundation's Art Bursary in 2010. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, again, it, it might be my memory, but um, I think it was in this room. And I remember there was a panel of five of us, maybe, and you came in and Karen incredibly sort of elegantly and quietly appeared and pulled out a vinyl record from the sleeve and placed it on a turntable and just stood back. I'm not sure you said a word practically, but it, 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 am I remembering right? And can you say a little bit more about the piece that you played to us on yes, that? So. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I, I had actually forgotten about that, but I did um, apply for the um, MK Arts Bursary, and um, it was partly the work that I wanted to make, but it also had the convenience sort of... Um, uh, byproduct that I didn't actually have to talk. So I thought if I make a record, this will be fantastic. I can put it on, I can demonstrate my work in the form of a record. And so I, I didn't, I'd said very, very little. So finally, this is payback. <laughs> yes, now <laughs> I have to talk. <laughs> um, and, but I do remember one thing very clearly because I was able to come in and put the record on. But of course, what I hadn't accounted for was that my hands were very shaky. So putting a record on with shaky hands is quite <coughs> tricky. Um, I d that was a, a vinyl record that I had pressed, um, and it was sort of an overview of my work, um, and I had uh, put little sections of my work in and then spoken about my work in between, and um, very happily I was awarded the bursary, which yeah, g gave me a great start, actually. In, in, uh, I hadn't been long in Milton Keynes, and also I had not that long quali qualified um, you know, it had got a degree in sound art, so I was, it was early days of my practice, really. And the bursary afforded me a great period of being able to explore, really, and further my work. Yeah. T talking about the early days of your practice, <coughs> uh, you mentioned again yesterday that uh, about 20 years ago you were releasing records, and that was your first foray into the sort of um, music scene. Could you say a little bit about that? Yes, when, when I was in my 20s, I suppose, <laughs> um, I was in a band and I released a couple of records um, and did that for really quite a few years. Um, and it seems like a very long time ago now and actually sort of throughout that time I've really seen the complete transfer from analogue to digital as well. So I've worked in every format almost imaginable from tape, you know, right the way through. Um, so, uh, the, yeah, the band, I mean, it, it, was, it was together for around, I suppose, about six or seven years, and it released a couple of LPs, and it did lots of touring, um, and, and it was a great experience. Um, but it's, the way the work's developed, I think, since then, I, I, uh, while I was in a band, I became much more interested in, I've always had a very DIY approach, and so the more I worked in studios, the more I wanted to work in my own studio, and it, sort of I gradually began to work with a computer and to develop my own studio and my own practice and be able to do things for myself really because prior to that my experience was going into a studio with a producer or so um, it's it, you know it's been a continuation really but it, it, it does have the advantage that I you know I can press records and I know quite a lot about all the sort of you know ways of doing things and um, I think I've brought a lot of that into my sound arts practice I think one of the m more fundamental things actually is um, about multi-channel. I work very much in a multi-channel way. And I think that comes um, from the recording process, really, because you're often sort of thinking in terms of tracks in a band or channels. And I think I've just scaled that up and up and up. And now I'm sort of doing 60 channels, which I wouldn't really recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first piece is that we, piece that we commissioned here or that you made for the gallery w was one that was um, uh, recording sounds made by stars and just stellar resonances, basically. And then the, it seems like there were quite a few works that came from that afterwards. Uh, uh, a piece that was at the ICA in London, uh, Icon, Birmingham, your OU commission. Uh, they were all kind of extensions of on this theme, weren't mm -hmm. they? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, the, the stellar resonances, in fact, are something that I'm, I still work with and I'll be working with next year. Um, so I became, I'm, I'm interested in sounds that are not immediately evident. I'm always wanting to kind of find things, hidden voices and, and sounds that are not perhaps ignored or, or we can't hear them. Maybe they need to be made audible. So um, I have done a lot of work with stellar resonances, solar resonances and um, orbits of exoplanets. I've, I've I've been quite lucky to have a collaboration with um, the University of Birmingham and they work on um, a, a very big NASA project um, and that is the hunt for exoplanets which has been quite exciting over the past sort of, I suppose it's nearly 15 years or so, um, or maybe longer. Um, th I, uh, I approached them because I was interested that they actually listen to, well, they study data on the resonances of stars so that th they these are oscillations that are made by the stars. They aren't audible because they're very, very slow for a start, and also there's no medium to carry the sound, but they're there, you know, so they're, they are potentially sound that is out in space. And when I found out about this, I was very uh, excited about it, and I approached that research team, and I've been working with them since that piece, actually. Uh, that piece was in 2012, um, and I've made those other pieces. And, and it's, it's been... It's sort of had more of a direct um, influence on my composition as well, because thinking about frequencies, orbital periods, how things come round, how rhythm works in the world generally. I mean, I would say that's still a part of making this piece, you know, listening to the various rhythms of the city. You know, some of them are, you know, they're, they're all sort of doing their own loops or coming in at particular times. and. Um, you know, it's a, a way of working that I really enjoy. So, um, yeah, so the stellar and solar resonances is continuous. Um, you mentioned the University of Birmingham, and I see in the blurb you've um, said that you're a creative fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Yes. What, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it means I'm creative. <laughs> so that's a relief. But, um, <laughs> um, well, it, I'm, I'm yet to find out, actually, because I have been artist in residence there. I spent... 2014 with a team of astro seismologists in the School of Physics and Astronomy and um, I mean I didn't stay there but I traveled up there a lot throughout that year and established a kind of dialogue with the scientists and made a piece at the end of that so um, that's uh, so this year they've just made me a creative fellow so that will be um, a position where I continue to work with their data. They've got a very exciting new mission, so there'll be lots of data coming in, I think, next September, perhaps. So I'll be looking and listening to that and making a new piece. Excellent. Uh, and one of your most recent pieces, I think, was in Philadelphia. Yes. Um, but I haven't been able to find very much information about it, so maybe you could tell us what you yes. made for them. Yeah, um, so that's a piece called Resonant Space. Um, and it's the latest in a series of quiet commissions. There's a curator, Robert Blackson, and he's made this lovely series of quiet commissions, which are near silences. So he's invited artists to make sort of silences to go in the silence of the gallery, as it were. So Cornelia Parker has done one, and Sophie Kai, um, Autumn Chacon. Um, so I was invited to go and make a silence, which was quite exciting for me. Mm -hmm. And I took, oh, well, Robert knew about my work um, with uh, also with VLF radio signals, so naturally occurring radio signals and the stellar resonance is two things that I'm interested in. And um, invited me out to Philadelphia to make a work, but I usually work site specifically, so I went out to make it out there. And I was using the resonators, I was quite excited about taking the resonators, which are actually on the windows of Centre MK. Um, I wanted to use those to make the piece because they're so... Um, you know, they're almost not there. And um, so I took them out, but I didn't really know what I was going to do with them when I... I mean, I knew the piece I was going to make, more or less, but I didn't know where they were going to go. I thought they were going to go on a window, some windows. So I would sort of had all the photos through and I'd kind of uh, selected these spots that I thought might be good. But when I got there, I ended up putting them, well, within the air conditioning. So they're actually completely hidden and they come. the sound comes from the ducts in the air conditioning. So... It's called Resonant Space. It's very, very quiet. Um, but it's there, you know, and um, it's emanating from the air conditioning. So it's very quiet in the gallery. I'm not really sure 
uh, if it travels to the rest of the building, because of course air conditioning can take sound everywhere, so it's maybe it's really loud somewhere else, but it's quite cal- quite quiet in the gallery. Excellent. And maybe now we should talk about this extraordinary commission that you've made. Um, uh, it's been described as a, a sonic portrait of Milton Keynes, which I think is is a, a beautiful idea. Um, just before. Uh, we talk about it a few people to thank, though. Um, there is a, a, a steering group that sits on, um, that uh, kind of helps us with uh, the strategy and direction of the Overall City Club. And uh, many thanks to Liz Gifford for, for chairing that steering group and Sunita Yeomans for being part of that as well. Um, the original steering group for this uh, particular commission included um, uh, Ian Stanton from Bletchley Park. And a huge thanks to Bletchley Park, uh, um, particularly uh, Erica Munro. Uh, but also Sarah Armand, Kate Travers, and Jonathan Byrne. Um, thank you very much for, for managing this project and, and helping Caroline through to its realisation. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to work uh, with Bletchley Park, and hopefully there'll be lots of uh, opportunities with you again in the future. Uh, Mark Gavid, as well, from the Open University, was uh, involved in early discussions. Amanda Mulcher and Elizabeth, Elizabeth Knight from the Cooper Newton Museum. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Bill Griffiths from the Milton Keynes Museum, uh, first Hank and then Noel James from the Discovery Centre, uh, and Melanie Jeevans from the Living Archive. I, I hope, I think that's everyone uh, who was on that. And um, uh, we had no idea what would be the outcome uh, of this commission, uh, but I, for one, and, and, and as I said, I'm absolutely thrilled. Also, big thanks, of course, to the Centre MK and Kevin Duffy. Uh, I happen to think that that is one of the most beautiful spaces in Milton Keynes and, and beyond. So. Uh, it's a well-chosen uh, space and hugely grateful to all the, the efforts that they have made um, to remove the ping-pong tables. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, for those <laughs> ping-pong fans, they'll be back soon, I think. Um, uh, and uh, so how to uh, uh, approach... Um, I hope most of you have had a chance to... Um, I was going to say see it, but uh, hear it uh, and enjoy it. I've uh, spent quite a bit of time there over the last couple of days and I just love watching people's faces as they walk by. Um, uh, particularly when the football chant starts, and there's an intense emotional um, feeling. Uh, maybe we should start by talking about the, um, uh, the football. And I think when you, we talked about it yesterday, it really underlined how overlooked, overheard sound is. Um, and you said that, uh, that Dons had never been asked by anyone to make a sound recording. Uh, people always just want to go and take pictures. Um, but you also said, quite rightly, if you made a sort of uh, a, a map, a visual map of, of, of the sound, it would tell, you know, it would absolutely tell the story of the match. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it was a great opportunity to go and record the match at the Dons. So uh, Ben Campbell at MK Dons arranged it for me. and. I was quite surprised when I got there to have a press pass and it all to be very official and to be told that I could either sit with the fans or go on the pitch. I said, I will not go on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of being perhaps caught on match of the day later on <laughs> too embarrassing. But recording the sound at a football match was, uh, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. And uh, it, it, as with many things in this project, um, you know, I, I like listening, but... I, sometimes you listen anew, you get a new way to listen and there I had a new way to listen to a football match and as Anthony says when I took the recordings home luckily there were some goals because, <laughs> because also the first goal was to the opposition so then it all got really deathly quiet and then there was another goal and then there were a huge roar and everyone was jubilant again and of course when I look at the sound waves I, I, I'm very much you know in tune with sort of looking at how sound is um, and the representation of the match is fantastic. You can, you can see, you can see someone's anticip, you can hear someone anticipates the goal. There's one person in there who who knew it was going to happen, and then you know the goal happens, and the, and this actually just looking at the sound wave was fantastic. And I and I think yeah, the Dons were surprised at someone asking just to record the sound, and um, quite excited about that. And yeah. And of course, you had to um, do a bit of self-censorship at certain points. Well, yeah. <laughs> there was a few chants that maybe weren't so great. <laughs> um, onto a different kind of chanting. I think w- what's remarkable is how many different kinds of choirs uh, yes. you worked with yeah. uh, across the city. Yeah. Could you say a bit about... I mean, this has been re- you know, really fantastic for me because um, also... 
it's difficult with a project. You know, you, 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 especially in a, in a case like this, I wanted to propose something, but of course a project will always be finding its way. I can't say exactly what it will be. Um, so the discovery and the working with the choirs across the city has been a you know, really fantastic experience for me. They're wonderful and there are so many and I've sort of managed to find them sort of through one choir, through another, or just coincidentally, really. So um, the very start uh, of, of the choir work was because Amazing Grace was written in Olney, which, of course, is a fantastic thing. Um, and so I was very keen to put Amazing Grace in the piece. Um, I mean, I find it incredible that it was just written up the road. And, and I wanted to find a gospel choir, so I began looking around. Who, who could I find, you know, looking on the internet? And I found Joy Community Choir, and they're in Newton Lees. Um, and I think that was actually... I, I first contacted them in December, because I must have gone to... I went to their pre-Christmas rehearsal. Um, and that's another thing about the piece, is that, you know, this isn't sort of like you know, hired hands, turn up at the studio, you know, it's, these are people's lives, you know, these are things that people do maybe once every two weeks, once a month, they get together, and it's actually quite hard to coordinate a recording session, because everyone's got football on a Saturday morning, you know, and so um, when I hear the piece, I, you know, I hear all of those people's lives and stories and things within it. Um, so I initially worked with Joy Community Choir, who were fantastic, and they, I, I gave them an arrangement of amazing in Grace, which they then went away and learned. You know, that took a few weeks because they only meet every two weeks. Um, and then they came back and we recorded with Matthew Holly at the Open University. Um, and so that's been a joy to have them in it. Um, and from there, then, uh, you know, I was sort of seeking out more voices. Um, and the second choir then, then that are oh, in January, I sort of looked at the diary or anything that I could find that was going on in Milton Keynes, and I saw that um, a piece called Speminalium was going to be performed in Stony Stratford. Well, it's a piece by Thomas Tallis. It's a really ambitious piece and um, rarely performed, and it was being performed by the Open University uh, Choir and four other choirs from Milton Keynes. So I had that in my diary, and I emailed, I got in touch with the choir director, Bill Strang, who's here this evening, and I asked, would I be able to come and record that? So Spem and Allium was, you know, my next choir that I recorded, um, and that's fantastic. It's a, a superb piece. It's, uh, there were 117 people singing that night, um, which is a gorgeous sound, and with my multi-channels, I can make them even more. <laughs> so it's a very, very big <laughs> piece, but it was a fantastic performance, such a rare thing and a fantastic thing to be able to capture, so I was thrilled to work with them as well. Um, then I continued, oh, then coincidentally, um, somebody, a, 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 a woman, Anne, who um, came up to approach me at that um, performance and because she realised I was interested in working with the choirs and she introduced me to her choir, which is Beyond the Sea Choir, the directors of which are in front of me here. Um, so I then um, made got in touch with the directors, and put me in touch with them, and I said, can I come and hear your rehearsal? And Beyond the Sea are run by Faye, um, Faye Greg Margaret, and they meet once a month yeah, in uh, Pear Tree Bridge, and they are all, all members of the choir are living with the effects of cancer. It's an absolutely fantastic uh, rehearsal, really joyful and... Um, you know, a great occasion for everyone, I think, and so good. You know, I, I mean, I really believe we should sing, all of us, more. But, because um, it just, if nothing else, it helps us breathe. But um, I went to a couple, few, couple of rehearsals, recorded them, and I had a wonderful time. So then I had another set of recordings, um, and those recordings I was very excited about, and I had a, an idea for what I'd like to do with those recordings. I wanted to put them onto the Tanoi, because I loved the idea that the voices of the people could be broadcast throughout the shopping centre. You know, the tannoy that you're usually just ignoring or you can't really hear what it's saying. And I, so I um, asked the centre MK, who, you know, very, very good of them to let me use the tannoy. So every two hours, there's a, a, a sort of tiny polyphon, which is a, a small instrument from the Milton Keynes Museum. That comes on the tannoy and then the voices of Beyond the Sea Choir. So that was quite exciting to be able to do that. 
I then, I was also going to, to any events and generally recording as much as I could because a lot of things I'd just get by chance. I couldn't know if something was going to happen. So um, I, I went to Art in the Park, which is um, the festival in the summer, um, right, run by Islamic Arts and Culture. And um, I there heard a Japanese choir, wonderful Japanese choir. So um, I contacted them and I worked with them as well. So. So the choirs, I sort of, I could never have known, but I just sort of found them throughout, and uh, it's been a pleasure to meet them all. Fantastic. Uh, which also leads me on to ask about a, a different kind of song, which is bird song. And I think you actually went on a course. I did, yes, early in the year. Um, I'm very interested in bird song anyway, but uh, I saw that there was a course being run, not by the Parks Trust, but Martin Kincaid from the Parks Trust was doing it with another bird watching expert and it was to pick out individual bird songs so you know the, the song of specific uh, species of bird so which was absolutely fascinating and it is really really difficult because they don't just have one song obviously but they you know they have song they have sub song they have song when they're learning I mean it's really just it's there's so much to learn but I managed to begin to be able to pick out some of them and name some of the birds um, what was fantastic about that was meeting um, naturalists who are, you know, there's many king naturalists here and, and there's huge biodiversity in Milton Keynes as well and that's all due to the planning really of the, you know, how the natural environment was planned from in great detail. Um, and so I met some naturalists and I um, ended up well, up at 3.30 three on the 7th of May, yeah, I remember the date, um, <laughs> to go and record the dawn chorus in Linford Wood, which I, which I thoroughly recommend. It's amazing, really, to, you know, the experience of sort of going into a wood in the dark and uh, then, and happily, I wouldn't have gone into the wood in the dark on my own, happily one of the naturalists, uh, Mike Leroy, uh, accompanied me and um, we recorded, we managed to record the dawn chorus for about two hours that morning, which is, which is throughout the piece. So all the birds that you hear in the piece, most of, uh, many of them are recorded dur during that dawn chorus. Um, but also I was making a binaural recording. Now, binaural recording is where you put microphones in your ears and it's always a bit of a trade-off because what it means is that you can't actually listen very well. So having got up you know, really super early to hear the dawn chorus, I then had to put microphones in my ears. And I mean, I could still hear it a bit, but you know, it wasn't quite the same. So, but what, what I didn't anticipate was that there would be loads of mosquitoes. And, I mean, I was eaten alive, but I also, because I had a binaural headset on, you know, it's very important not to make sound yourself, so I was really trying not to scratch. There's, and there are bits in the recording where I just couldn't bear it any longer. So, but, there's all, but also, I mean, when I got back and then reviewed the recordings and, and, and captured these mosquitoes that were literally just flying past the ears, it was such a delight to hear them in the recordings and then to put them onto the glass and realise that I could, you know, these ti I'd captured these tiny things and they could be, you know, diffused across the glass. It was, it was all worth it. <laughs> I love the mosquitoes, actually. They sound a bit like a, a motorbike, you know, whizzing <laughs> past. Or, or cello, I think you, d you described yes. it. But yeah. they really sort of punctuate the rest of, of the sound, don't they? <coughs> um, another, well, I, I think you said yesterday that you, you've, actually recorded many, many thousands of hours of different yeah, things exactly. and, and, um, and hoping to, to pick up on some uh, incidental um, moments that would uh, be really uh, pertinent uh, to the piece and, and not, none more so, I think, than the, is it 10 seconds, uh, of, of the happy birthday, which, yes. which kind of is a song too for Milton Keynes' 50th birthday, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think that was, t you know, I spent two days at the, uh, at the Art in the Park Festival and, you know, to, to get that 10-second recording of whatever it is of the happy birthday was, uh, yeah, quite a coup. So, yeah, that's definitely, that was my approach. Very special, very special moment. I also love the, um, uh, the spoken word uh, in it. Uh, it's great that you've got a short interview with Stuart Moscrop. Uh, one of the architects of the space in yep. which uh, the sound piece is. I also uh, love hearing uh, Boyd and Evans um, telling us their stories of the city, particularly an underpass that becomes a didgeridoo um, <laughs> when you stamp your feet. 
Sorry? <laughs> you'll, you'll have to di divulge which, which uh, underpass it is, otherwise you'll see people jumping up and down <laughs> at all the underpasses in the city. Um, what about William Cooper and his yes. poetry? Yeah. I think you were surprised when yes. you got into that and yeah. discovered all sorts of connections to sounds, didn't you, in yes. his work? Yes, that was fantastic. Um, I, I'm very interested in uh, the acoustic ecology movement. Um, there's a composer called R. Murray Schaefer who began it. Um, and he, uh, I suppose part of this project has been about mapping the city through sound, uh, because I have also made a sound map which is online, so where you can go and examine or explore some of the recordings that make up the installation. So, um, but I'm very interested generally in, I mean, Murray Schaefer talks about uh, the, our sonic environment as a giant composition for which we're all responsible and that we should all be mindful of it and we should be thinking about what sounds we're losing. Obviously, there's a general homogenization of sound these days, but you know, to, to just have an awareness of that because sounds can disappear and, and they can you know, be overtaken or pollution can get rid of them and obviously pollution is, affects nature and nature sounds are changing. So just an awareness of how sound is changing over time. So um, before the advent of recorded sound, our accounts of the landscape and the soundscape are from our poets and our writers. So I was very keen to start looking into the poetry of Handy That, William Cooper living just up the road in the 18th century. So I, um, and of course the Cooper and Newton Museum um, on the steering group as well. So when I visited the um, Cooper and Newton Museum, it was, uh, had a nice tour around and was sort of looking in the, you know, looking at the writing, but continually being reminded of the sonic, and he, he, he talks about the sonic, the sound a lot. You know, I think he was, he was very sensitive to sound um, and came away, he, he, he suffered from depression, he came away to Olney to get away from things, really. Um, and I think still he was very aware of sound, so he's got some wonderful, I mean, he has a poem that begins, there is in souls a sympathy with sound. Um, and as the mind is pitched, the ear is pleased. So he's really thinking about sound and how it resonates with us, you know. And, and, and then, of course, Amazing Grace, that's um, William Cooper was, uh, you know, a friend of John Newton who penned Amazing Grace. And, of course, you've got Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound as well. So there was just these lovely resonances. So I became very excited about the work of Cooper. And also its site-specific nature, because he will be talking about the ooze. You can still go down to the ooze. It's the same ooze where William Cooper was talking. So, it, it, you know, I was really excited that I could investigate this poetry and it had a mapping element to it and a site-specificity site um, that could be investigated. So, um, and that leads on to the poetry generally. So, um, you know, I, I was interested in nature. Cooper also is writing about nature and combining this with the field recordings. And, um, of course, there was um, a need for a voice for William Cooper. And uh, so I had been through the poems and was thinking about this. And um, that brings me ha happily on to you know, the wonderful poet Murray Lachlan Young, who I then invited to come and um, initially provide the voice of Cooper, but also, um, as it transpired, and as, as I hoped, that we would work further on poetry, because, um, you know, Murray brought to, to, to Milton Keynes his eye, you know, and th so the project really has poetry that spans three centuries, that is looking at the same area through th three centuries, which, um, you know, so uh, Murray came initially and made recordings of Cooper, which are fantastic, and it was great to hear these recordings coming to life, you know, because suddenly from the page, there was a voice speaking the words of Cooper. Um, and then, of course, the, we, we led on to the collaborative poems, which I think th th you've all got a copy of them there. Um, six very special site-specific poems uh, for Milton Keynes. Absolutely, and from one great poet to another, delighted that, um, that, that Murray's here and will come and, and join us and, and speak to us and hopefully read some of his poems to us as well. Great. Well, thank you, thank you, Murray. Thanks for being involved in the project. It's been such a rich uh, aspect of the work and uh, really rewarding and a fantastic collaboration, which I've really enjoyed. Yeah, it's been well. It's been it's been a, um, 
fascinating. It's been a real privilege to um, to work on it as well, and to to be a you know a small part of, of what's going on, and just to go and stand in the shopping centre which I was writing about in May, and uh, to to hear and and see the realisation of, of all the things that you were talking about um, when we sat there. And, and I thought one of the interesting moments is that uh, just as the um, the sound started up to the two skateboarders came whistling through the obviously illegally as well <laughs> and so it's, uh, um, came whistling through along the travertine floor there and they brought um, a, a sound of Milton Keynes a very vibrant sound of Milton Keynes came straight through and immediately there was another collaboration going on but then they collaborated a bit too long <laughs> <laughs> and the security had to ask them to go and collaborate with someone else somewhere else yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was it, that felt very special to me in the way that I, I felt that you'd been treating the sound of, of Milton Keynes and the way that we we tried to incorporate um, the, the 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 natural which was very much um, inspired by the initial uh, meeting with William Cooper, um, and and before the the city, you know, was even uh, a spark of an idea, through to what we um, are now involved with in in, in a you know a, a city which is maturing. You know, it's fi what fifty years old. It's interesting. So so this this summer I've done the. Um, 60th anniversary of Test Match Special Poem, the 70th anniversary of Ferrari Motors Poem, and now I'm involved in the 50th anniversary of Milton Keynes. So it's been a summer of anniversaries, but uh, and it's been really, really thrilling to to be um, to discover Milton Keynes as well. And and it's been it's been very interesting. People saying, so what are you doing? And I say, I'm working in in Milton Keynes, and you've got no idea how amazing and, and spectacular a city it is. And 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 it's been it's such a, pr a pleasure to be um, to be hosted by you um, and and allowed to to go to so to have all of the these wonderful places mapped out for me and so you're saying okay now we're going here and each time it's been a uh, um, uh, a really um, eye-opening experience and ear-opening experience. Mm -hmm. I think one, one of we worked sort of um, initially on the, the on the recordings of <coughs> Cooper, and then we did a day together around the sites that yes. I had chosen, didn't we? And so I suppose we were capturing. Um, I was capturing sound while Murray was making his notes, and that was quite. Uh, it, it was a collaboration, the type of collaboration I had never done before, uh, capturing a moment at the same time, but then going away and working sort of separately. Yeah, and. Uh and it was a really, it was, it was good. Uh, the thing I found um, really exciting about it as well is that the, the William Cooper ordeal, of a <laughs> because I had sit for, was it a day or two days? Yes, just it was a day, it just uh, felt like two. A, 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 a <laughs> just reading one poem, and there were, you know, a, beautiful poems, and I'd read them all before, but to sit there and just pump these things <laughs> out, one after another, trying to connect with each one, you know, so what, So not just to read them into a microphone and say, right, done, but to actually really make a connection with each poem. And by the time we, we got to the end of it, I, I, I felt like uh, my, my head was going to fall off. But, <laughs> but interestingly enough, when it came to writing the pieces, it's, uh, I was saying, um, there seemed to be a sort of coding process that went on within the um, within the reading of William Cooper that then started coming out almost um, unaided during the writing of my poems. And I've been trying to write um, um, observational nature-based poetry. And, and it was like there was a bit of William Cooper which had, uh, had landed inside me. And I can definitely <laughs> feel it. in And, and I, had, I was listening to them on the train on the way up. And I was thinking, it's really interesting to see how much influence that cramming of Cooper um, uh, um, left. Mm -mm. Actually, I remember at the end of the session you saying you could, you actually just had that sort of meter going round in your head. It was like it was going to stay for a while. 
Yeah, I think it's in there for good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you also read the letters of Cooper, which were lovely as well, That's weren't right. they? And, yeah, and so, quite so there was intimate. A, mm, yeah. So there was a real immersion into, and of course the immersion of the work of, uh, the immersion into the work of Cooper then of course becomes an immersion in, into the, the local scenery and landscape, mm. um, which of course, when we went out to Willand Church, and, and that area, you know, you, you look at it and, you, and, and, and very much in the same way as you were discussing, you know, the ooze still being the same ooze that he stood on the banks of, you know, there is that direct connection with the land mm. and despite the fact that there's a city standing on that land, it's still the same place, mm. you know, it's, it's still the same part of the country and it hasn't moved geographically, but, and then our response to what is now mixed with what was then, again, was another very exciting part of of, of, of piecing together the the history of you know the, the city of things mm, mm, mm. I mean I was we captured the same moment I suppose both sonically and in Murray's mind um, and uh, you know of course I was aware we were doing that but I what I, I wasn't prepared for how that would feel when the poems came back um, well actually once we'd recorded the poems and the words were there to listen to, um, and then I could marry them up with the field recordings, and there were, you know, flies on the gravestones were in the recording. You know, the child whizzes by, the child's voice is in the recording, the electric bikes, I can hear them. So Murray's mentioning things that you know, he's uh, observing and thinking about and then uh, talking about the same things that are on my recordings. And I, I, I mean, I knew we were doing that, but it, it was, I wasn't prepared for how that would feel once I got to listen back to the two things together. And it's, it's, it feels like a sort of um, a doubling up of the concept of, of the creative concept of what novelty is, and the idea of novelty seems to be um, the placing of of, uh, of two um, uh, not unrelated or, or disparate um, uh, ideas, one next to the other, and 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 those two things then expanding into a group, which then provides something which provides interest. And I think the same thing works with sound. And so the idea of, of, of um, uh, horizontal lines and green and, and banks of green together, or granite and green, green granite, and just the, the ideas of all of the, um, the visual um, ideas that can be placed together um, from a, a, a verbal perspective, then placed next to the, the idea of a sonic perspective, and then the two things being fused, that, that had a, an effect which I wasn't expecting mm. as well. And it was, uh, it was, it was much more than I, that I expected. Mm. And I think then the, the idea of, of things being different, providing the idea of novelty, but then the idea of two types of the same, which is what we're talking about mm -hmm. with the sound and, and the word, mm. um, then providing a strange new sense of novelty. Yeah. Which, which, which adds to, I suppose, the, the sort of patina of, of the piece and to the broader um, uh, patina and perspective of, 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 of the larger project. Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like, anyway. Mm. So will we, shall we shall read a poem? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. So uh, the first poem we're going to do is Underpass. And this is not the computer I made the work on. It's a much older one, so if it does belly out, I'll just leave Murray to do it by himself, but hopefully... I have to watch well. the sound here as well. Yeah. So um, this is uh, Underpass. It was the underpass that leads to Campbell Park. Um, and compositionally, some of the bass notes are coming from the Doppler shift of the cars. Underpass, Murray Lachlan Young, May 2017. Past polished granite, 
horizontal lines. Organic banks of green perspective lie, with tallest lampposts peeking ever down on motors, purring tires, sweep and grate. Buses float above as if suspended. Cyclists ride by with whirring feet, drifting silent in dappled breezes, ghosts to this saturated sonic scene. One foot leads, the other foot follows on. Architecture shapes the sloping sky. Whilst a mother buggy passes transit speed, electric bikes zing swift and sleekly by. Four white pillars hold the road suspended. Sunlight shadows decorate below. The CCTV watches as I wander under smooth scape concrete, air and steel. A dandelion seed sweeps through and on beneath ice white buzzing lights protected. Past paper coffee cup in quiet repose, magpies standing, watching, too, for joy. An avenue of London plane trees grow. A turnabout face sees a full reversal. The sky sits low and fresh below the road into the future they once surely saw. Thank you. That was the most difficult technical piece to do. Yeah, that it? was difficult yeah. technically, yeah. Um, but uh, actually, there's, I was reminded during that piece of uh, the way that some of this worked. There's a line that you say that I love in that, well, I love many of them, but architect architecture shapes the sloping sky. And there's a... And that mm. was a direct kind of response, I suppose, to those words and that rhythm that you had sort of created there. So there was a you know kind of continual back and forth, I suppose, of uh, in, you know it, it, of the work responding. But it's amazing what an underpass can do. I, I was just I was just thr <laughs> thrilled. It's such a beautiful thing, you know, really it's such a beautiful thing with buses um, as if they're floating in the sky, and you know the the, the whole the whole thing to. To actually um, open up the 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 eye to it, and and just to describe what it is, you know, and try and be very simple about it, and in, in, in almost that sort of early Hemingway style of like just record what it is and try and do it as simply as possible, rather than try to um, embellish and, and add too much to it. I mean, there's a bit more embellishment in the next one, which is the Cathedral of Trees, but. I just with architecture and the, the idea of the architecture of the underpass of just trying to say what it is and allow that to speak for itself was, was the idea. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go for the, yeah. Cathedral of yes, Trees, the Cathedral of Trees, which I found amazing. I was just the idea, just the idea that someone had had the idea to, to, to create a Cathedral of Trees and the idea of like it's a city and it's got this cathedral. Um, I was. I was hugely impressed by. Are you ready? Yep. That one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cathedral of Trees, Murray Lachlan Young, 2017, May. A cathedral in its infancy, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, a sacred shrine of living trees, of root and trunk and branch and leaf, of perfect specimens brought here from long 
and far and wide. No banners of bold regiments, no buried bishops, saints or kings, no gargoyle buttress finial, no heating bills or roof to mend. The sylvan song of silver maple meet the ragged redwood bark. The hornbeam poplar, yew and ash combine in shaded symmetry. No crucifix, no bleeding Christ, no stained glass windows throwing light. The cool breeze blows a drifting feather through the temple of deep green. Cherry, pine and holly oak, English oak and sacred thorn, a canopy of cool reflection reaches upward to the sky, the roots entwining ever downward. Many hidden secrets lie past cypress, maple, cedar leaves. All are one and one is all reaching to the starry heavens in this cathedral of the trees. Straight on to the last one. Yeah. Okay. So this is the the sort of it's the longest one, I guess, and um, it's called a place within the grid, and it's, uh, it's it's the I it's it's based in the in the shopping centre, which I didn't I must admit it didn't really fill me with much uh, kind of enthusiasm when when you suggested that's what we're going to do until we got there and uh, and and I'd realized that it wasn't just you know like <laughs> any other shopping center it was a really truly beautiful and fabulous space and but uh, also the funny thing I thought about it one of the most interesting things was you think of shopping centers and you know the the, the really horrible Tesco's and stuff that you see and the way that the, that the styles of architecture and despite the fact that Milton Keynes is such a young city comparatively this is a very old shopping centre, but it's also a style of um, architecture and design which is superior to any other shopping centre I've ever seen, and is a is a is a, is a world class building. So it's just got this whole um, kind of uh, 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 the idea that, it, but it's still, despite the age of the architecture, represents a sense of modernity which outstrips any other shopping centre that you see in the, in, the, in the awful styles which are demanded by local councils to fit in with what they consider to be their, their, their planning ideas. So there's, there's something, and that, that, was the, that was the first thought, and then so the rest is in the poem. So it begins with, um, with a, an instrumental part. Um, it, it actually starts with, a, as you will hear, an announcement from the shopping centre. And it, it gives some indication of maybe how I've developed the composition throughout the work, because I've used a lot of the tonality of the city. So in the, in the piece Underpass, the, the Doppler shift of the cars is providing the, the baseline. Um, for this piece, I took the woman's announcement who says, ladies and gentlemen, for the comfort of all our visitors, and so she comes in at the beginning, and then I sort of, um, I processed that until I could get the real melody of how she was speaking, and that's actually the melody of the tune. It's a very happy kind of melody, so I've sort of ex extrapolated it from her announcement. Can I ask one question before? Yes. What is a Doppler shift? Oh, Doppler shift is when a car or anything or a mosquito comes past you and ah. sound waves get bunched up physicists in the room. <laughs> they are bunched up as they come towards you and then they spread out as, they, so as the, the train, thing goes away. the train going, yeah. okay, That's right, a Doppler right, shift, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> right, okay. Thank you. 
A Place Within the Grid, Murray Lachlan Young, May 2017. Walls of glass meet walls of glass, precision built and rubber spaced. A rustle from within the hedge, a wild thing is a step away. An architect's decisive vision that life forms can accommodate by which birds now navigate, now a grand old shopping centre. A child's voice around the corner blends with birdsong, shoppers pass with thoughts of things that buzz beneath the giant palms inside the glass. Ships of flesh on flat, calm ocean of the palest travertine, a rose emerges from the privet calling to the maple bough, yet this is different from the others. This is not just the same old thing. This is something from a dream of what could be and what now is. The sky is cut in half to view through inside-outside mirrored optic climbs the dark magnolia as guardrails reach in contemplation. But what is now and what now is in this the future world, a people's world, considered thus, imagined by dead of modern past. A skateboard hisses in the distance. A child scoots behind the glass. Electric doors await a question. The hand of entropy presses beneath the double height of glass and steel. Low slung, vast, the sprawling remains of those dead thoughts that live into the present moment now. Hard edges meet the rising air. Walls of glass meet walls of glass, precision built and rubber spaced, a grid within another grid, within a view of lakes and trees and churches, hills and leaning lines and coast and sea and sky of blue a spinning ball, a vast expanse of stars and planets, solar systems, life and death and birth and thought and sound and light and thought and deed and structures that contain a truth that someone had a thought and someone made that thought come true and here I stand within that thought beneath the sky of deepest blue. Thank you very much. Um, incredibly moving and thought-provoking, and um, I suspect I won't be the only one who leaves here and um, sees, or at least hears, the world in a different way and uh, experiences it slightly differently, thanks to uh, these two. Um, we'd be, we'd really like you to um, chip in and uh, ask questions or make comments, uh, particularly the participants. Maybe just before doing that, a couple of people I'd like to thank, uh, Lee Farmer and Emma Wilde for uh, helping with uh, setting up the work. Incredible dedication as ever. I think I spotted you somewhere if you're still here. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, and as we get into questions, just again, the point of how do we get more people to come and hear this piece? Please do spread the word. Uh, social media or just tell your friends, uh, bring them along. Um, the piece is up for how long? Till the 5th of November. Till the 5th of November. So please do encourage people to come. We're thinking about ways of reinventing the piece in the future in other forms. Uh, so we'll let you know about that in, um, in due course. Does anyone want to say anything or ask anything? Can I, can I make a suggestion since you started by referring to records? Oh, right, yes. Is there not a Christmas album here? <laughs> limited edition vinyl. For those of us who still have vinyl. Or yeah. for other people who want to put it on the wall. Anthony, money raiser. <laughs> Thank you. That's a lovely idea. Yeah. <laughs> 
I think, I mean, all of the poems, all of the recordings, the, the choirs, the, you know, the fantastic uh, individual things that I've been lucky to capture, they are all on the, on the website, uh, which sort of maps the city through sound. And so it is possible to hear the individual recordings um, at cityofthings.co.uk. And they're all sort of geographically located throughout the city. So Beyond the Sea Choir will be in their spot in Pear Tree Bridge. Um, Cooper's poem will be by the Bank of the Ouse. So I hope you'll have an opportunity to discover it that way. The record would be lovely, though. I'm very keen on vinyl myself. Well, Nikki did actually raise that point yesterday, I think. So there, there might be something in it. Thanks very much, Rob. Great. <laughs> Anyone else? We'll Any press more? One. Any more? <laughs> if there aren't any questions perhaps we've been quite comprehensive yeah, and um, we've spoken a lot <laughs> haven't we <laughs> but hopefully you feel well informed and um and nourished and uh, huge thanks to both of our speakers today it's been a real pleasure thank you and we'll have to restage this i think um uh, in the future at some point if we could invite you back at some point in, uh, in the new building hopefully um, to inaugurate the new auditorium with uh, better sound systems and uh, et cetera. Uh, and thank you very much to all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, please come back. Um, the next big event that we're organizing is actually on the 21st of October. It's a Saturday. It's Feast of Fire. It's a very different um, event altogether. There will be spectacular fireworks and displays along Midsummer Boulevard. Uh, it's free. Um, come along, bring your friends, bring your family. It should be an extraordinary event, and it really is the, the big... Uh, 50th uh, anniversary celebration, so please uh, join us in that. Thank you very much. Thank you.